Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Lucio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to Drive On. I'm your host, Scott Deluzio, and today my guest is Corey Poirier. Corey is an author, a speaker, and advocate for finding purpose and passion to address the mental health crisis we're facing today. Uh, his insights into this topic are rooted in his own personal journey and research, uh, making him a valuable voice in the conversation about mental health and well-being. And so with that, welcome to the show, Corey. I'm really glad to have you here. Oh, thank you so much. I'm I'm really excited to be here. Looking forward to making some magic. Excellent. I I love it. Yeah. Um, Could you start off maybe by telling our audience a little bit about yourself and your background, kind of who you are and what led you to become uh, so passionate about the importance of finding purpose and passion in life, especially uh, in the context of mental health? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I guess, two sides to that in the sense that there's what kind of, uh, I guess, drew me to it from a um, personal perspective in in just in relation to what it did for my life. And then there's also uh, what I think is the connection, or I believe myself is the connection based on a lot of interviews, so a lot of research to uh, mental health as well. And so first and foremost, I battled uh, generalized anxiety and hypochondria for about four solid years. I mean, probably much longer than that with the anxiety, but four years that I can say for sure. Um, The hypochondria side, for those that might not be familiar with it, I mean, I jokingly said, but there was probably some truth to it. I spent so much time in doctor's waiting rooms that, you know, I probably should have my own coffee mug in their office. (laughs) And it was because, for those that don't know, hypochondria is when you hear about a disease or an illness, and you develop the symptoms of said illness or disease, even though you don't have the symptom or disease. And so uh, I battled that for about four years. And it's honestly, it was like I compartmentalized my life. Like it was like all I could picture was like, I don't know how to explain this, but it was like minute by minute, like everything seemed forever because when you're feeling like you're not going to, you're not going to live because again, the hypochondria, you think you're going to have a disease that will probably, uh, end your life pr- uh, prematurely, or you think that with anxiety, like you're always anxious and always on edge. Um, it's really hard to look at the future, like to see a future. Mm-hmm. And so I say that to say how this relates to me is I tried all your traditional and normal methods for alleviating these two things I was dealing with. And uh, my mother's bipolar, mental illness runs in my family. So uh, it would make sense that I would struggle as well. The only thing that ever changed it was ultimately, uh, Scott, whenever I, this one night got tricked into performing stand-up comedy. And what happened was it wasn't the comedy that did it. It was when I went to the office the next day, people in my office said, did you meet like a girl or something? Or because you seem like you, you know, you met someone or you have a different feel about you, an aura or jump in your step or something. And uh, and I, I didn't really still know what finding a passion meant. But I knew that was a hint. Like I knew why, why do I feel different? And I felt different too. It wasn't just how they viewed me. And I'm like, what is this? Anyway, so I just went back and performed the next week, back and performed the next week, back and performed the next week. And by the way, bombing, as we call it in comedy, like no laughs. <laughs> like it was a solid year before I got a hearty laugh. Like, and I was going every week, sometimes two or three times a week performing. Um, but I, I kept going back. And even though I was bombing, I felt good. Like I, something had changed. And it was honestly probably less than a month after the people at my office said did something change that my hypochondria and anxiety i realized i I wasn't thinking about them anymore i wasn't focused on them like i wasn't everything had changed like honestly i can say that as far as from a perspective of being in the doctor's office all the time literally it stopped like i mean like if you looked at the dates like i went from being there every three weeks to not being in the doctor's office for like three years just overnight. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that changed is I had found what we'll call a passion. 
And I'll say a passion, because to me, passion is what you do. Purpose is why you're actually doing the thing. And usually for most people, in my experience, they don't discover the purpose until long after they've been doing the passion for a while. I say long, that's relative. It could be three months. It could be a year. It could be, you know, I mean, for some people, it might be two weeks. But I find for most people, they have to do the passion long enough to realize they love it. And then eventually they're like, oh, this is why I like doing this. And so for me, the passion part came out long before I ever realized why I like doing it. But just the passion part changed everything. And so I, I now say I took vitamin P on that day uh, for passion. And I say it's the only vitamin you can't buy in the stores, but it might be the most important one you ever take. And everything changed for me once I started taking that fictional vitamin. Uh, but uh, that's how, why I guess we'll say um, it, it was important to me and, and how it sort of hit me in my life. But then, like I say, the other aspect to it is mental health runs through and affects all, my family, but also, of course, everybody's families. I mean, I, I don't know the numbers now, but it's like, I think it's like every second person is affected by mental health in some way. Mm -hmm. And so that's a bit about both. That's how it impacted me and, and literally finding passion because you tied the two of them together in the intro literally changed my life. Like it literally helped me deal with this anxiety that was crippling me and changed everything. Now, the thing I can't say, as I'm not a doctor, I can't say that it would do the same for everybody else. But I will sure. say uh, a licensed doctor, uh, Vic, uh, Dr. Victor Frankel, who wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning about being in the Holocaust, he actually created his own therapy. I, I'll probably pronounce it wrong, but lipnotherapy. Uh, he created it based on what he learned about how he survived the Holocaust because he had meaning. And he went from being a talk therapist to helping people find meaning. And he said once he got to that stage, he could stop. He stopped treating mental illness. He literally just mm -hmm. helped people find purpose and meaning in their life. And he found that that changed everything for them. So again, I'm not a doctor. I can only cite what he said, but I also can say I've interviewed 7,500 people. So I've done a pretty good research study too. And in my experience, passion and purpose is the missing vitamin that most people aren't taking. I can see that. And you know, this show is geared towards military veterans and service members and, and folks in the military community. And a lot of times you hear people who are leaving the military who have a extremely big sense of purpose. You know, I'm serving my country. I'm, I'm defending, you know, I'm defending my country or my community, whatever, whatever it is that in their mind, like that is the purpose behind what they're doing. And then they leave their, their career in the military and they go off and they find a job somewhere doing whatever they're sitting behind a desk, crunching numbers, or, you know, they're doing some other thing that just doesn't quite add up to the same level of purpose uh, as, you know, serving in the military or, you know, serving a community like in a law enforcement role or, or something like that. When they move on to that next career, they lose that sense of purpose and they start to experience some of the things that, that you were discussing, uh, you know, the anxiety, maybe depression, uh, you know, other symptoms start to come out because, in my mind anyways, they, they are lacking that sense of purpose. They have no, no reason for doing it. There's no passion there either. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about your, your nine to five job, when you're sitting in a cubicle and, you know, doing God knows what for God knows why you're doing all these things. And it's like, yeah, the, there's no, there's no passion there. Right. And I'm not saying, don't work those jobs because it may be a great job. It may be a great career. Um, it may pay well. Benefits might be great. And there, there might be reasons for that, but there might be a need for something else. Right. And I think that's kind of, um, you know, the, the issue that a lot of times military veterans start to experience when they are leaving the military service. So I want to talk a little bit about how, you know, you, have obviously discovered this in your own life and where a lot of these symptoms have kind of faded away because you found a, a purpose, a passion, those types of things, but you're now working to help others find their purpose or passion in life. Um, you know, what inspired you to focus on this and help other people's and, um, you know, how, how are you doing that and, and what, uh, kind of drove you to to help those other folks? 
honestly, I, I feel like it's, there's, a, I mean, there's probably a couple of reasons, but I feel like the biggest one is because of how much it changed my life. You know, so I was, mm -hmm. uh, again, for lack of better term, struggling, like really in a lot of ways, reaching out for help and struggling. And because I lived that and knew what it felt like, and I knew the difference. Like, I, I think one of the biggest challenges, Scott, is that people who haven't found a purpose, or even if I say a passion, don't know what they're missing. So what I mean by that is, it's easy for Corey to say, you know, every day I wake up and I'm like that kid that loves Christmas. I literally wake up and I don't count watch the clock and I'm excited to start a new day. Uh, it's easy for Corey to say that. But if you've never felt that, like I didn't before I discovered it ultimately from stand-up comedy, before that I'd never felt that in my life. If you told me this is amazing, I would just think, oh, here we go, another one of those, oh, everything is great, and, you know, whistle and and call the birds to land on your hands person. Sure. But, but I now I know what I know and that this feeling I have, you can't, I can't get back behind the curtain. Like I know what I know. And I, so I have to pursue this because I can't imagine not feeling like I do every day when I wake up. And so mm -hmm. for me, I wanted other people to kind of experience that and taste that. Now, like I said, the biggest challenge is some people don't realize why it's worth doing the work because they don't know how good it can be on the other side. Um, right. Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote the book Conversations with God, uh, and I, I'm actually my newest book that we're actually um, in, in kind of launch mode now with is called The Enlightened Passenger. And I include a quote in there by Neil Donald Walsh and his words, this great quote he had said, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And for me, um, that truly happened. But I didn't get to the end of my comfort zone until I found something I was passionate enough about that I would actually push beyond my comfort zone. Um, so for me, I guess the reason I want to help other people with it is because most people don't know what it feels like because they've never had that experience. And I want to show people easier ways to discover that passion so that it doesn't seem like it's a big, it's a big stretch. It doesn't seem like it's actual physical work. And the interesting part is honestly, if the approach that we take, which is really meant to be writing down stuff and, you know, like literally writing down what, what, when you do this, the time's you don't watch the clock. Time sort of stands still. Uh, what is that thing? What is the thing you would do if you won the lottery? What's the thing you did as a kid and somebody talked you out of it? Let's go back to that thing. What's the thing that people say you're really good at? And so on and so forth. Well, the cool part about this is when I'm getting people to do that exercise and figure out what they should be doing, when you start taking action, you're literally doing things that you wrote on a list that you think you love doing. How can that be bad? And so the other side is it doesn't feel like work. But it's also the thing that you would probably do if money wasn't an issue. It's also the thing you probably should be doing as a side hustle, even if you keep a full-time job, because it's going to bring joy into your life, which is going to make life worth living anyway. So right. um, the answer to your, that was like going a bit deeper. But the answer to your question as to why I started doing that is because I felt the shift in my life and I wanted other people to have the same shift in their life. Yeah, and I can see that too. And I, I like that you mentioned how the um the the purpose or passion that the thing that that brings you joy in life uh may just be a side thing it may be a hobby it may not be a full-time job you know um you may really enjoy uh, for example you may really enjoy doing stand-up comedy that which is you know what you your example if let's say i discovered i really enjoy doing it but i'm not all that funny I'm not going to make a career doing it. You know, I'm I'm not going to be going on tours and doing doing all these shows where I'm I'm making tons of money doing that. So, yeah, I'm going to need another job to pay the bills and keep keep food on the table and all that type of stuff, but that might be something that I can do, you know, uh, at nights on the weekends, that type of thing here and there where where it it kind of gives me something to look forward to. And that's sort of the way I think of it. I'm not sure if that's that's how you think of it and how you approach it, but that's that in my mind, anyways. That's how I, I see it working, right? Yeah, I think it can work both ways. So people ask me often, um, "Okay, this all sounds great about finding my passion, but how is that going to pay the bills?" And right. I always respond, which it's not a sexy answer. It's not the answer people want to hear. It's probably not the answer I should even give them because then it puts me in a bad light. But I always say, if you're going into it thinking, um, how am I going to get paid to do it? Then it's truly not your passion hmm. because your passion you would do for free. I can tell you knowing what I know now, 
if I was either a independently wealthy before I ever started doing this, or I had a like mega high paying job that I could do it as a side hustle. And in fact, I was in sales and I was into six figures. So I was doing quite well as I did this on a side hustle. What I can tell you is if what I do now, if I had to actually, and I shouldn't even admit this because you know, you don't want clients here that's not want to pay you. But if I had to pay, like if I had to pay a thousand dollars a month to do what I'm doing now, I would do that. How many people can right. say that? I would literally pay a thousand dollars to do the job I do now and get paid to do. So what mm -hmm. I'm saying is, but at a, at a certain point when I started doing it, I wasn't getting paid. Like, so if I go back to speaking, that was the first real kind of hint towards this could be a career. I was a speaker and I was doing after dinner things. I was using my vacation days instead of going on vacation to do talks. Like I wasn't getting paid to do it early on. I mean, because it's speaking, you know that there's a career that could be had. Doesn't mean I'm ever going to be good enough to make money doing it, like you were mentioned in reference. But my point is, there can be a career there. But I went into it saying, if I had to pay to do this, I think I'd pay that to do this. And right. so that's the kind of passion when you find that all bets are off, and that's when you know things get better. It's like um, I had this guy named John Dunsworth, who's an actor in the show Trailer Park Boys, and I had him uh, one time tell me the story about him on the set of a show called Haven. And there were all these 14 year olds on set that day. And he's like 65 and he's dancing saying, what are we going to go do now guys? And they're like, Oh my God, dude, like what, what are you on? I got to get home and rest. And they said they were drooling and stuff. And they're like 14, 15, 16. Like it was a show, an episode where they had a bunch of younger people on. And he said, he said, I'm going to teach you guys something right now. He said, you need to figure out if acting is your gig. He said, because for me, so they said, how do you have so much energy still? He said, for me, I've been doing this 40 years. And he said, this is my love. Like, this is, I, this is my absolute love. And he said, so I haven't worked a day in 40 years. And he said, you tell me, well, however you describe work, how could I be tired if I'm never working? Like, I've, I didn't even work 14 hours today. I didn't work an hour. So how could I be tired? And, I, and again, that's, a cliche, that's similar to the cliche, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. But to me, it's a real story of a real dude that's living that. Well, that's the life I'm living. And so, again, going back to that, that original point is I want everybody to experience this because, you know, imagine what life could look like if we all found our seat on the bus and we're sitting in the right seats, found what we love. It would be glorious. Now, having said that, back to your other point, I still, when people ask me, how do I get paid to do this? I say, you need to go into this as something you'd love to do and you don't care if you get paid. And what will probably happen is the path to getting paid will eventually reveal itself. So that's, but people can't go and throw in the towel in their job and say, I'm going to, I'm a knitter. I love knitting with yarn. And I think I can make six figures this year doing that. Probably not going to happen. Now, having right. said that, I will say this, Scott, don't ever discount that there's a way to make money doing what you love, no matter what it is. Cause I said this, this is somebody the other day about knitting and with yarn. And I said, but then come to think of it. Who's to say you couldn't start up a TikTok or a YouTube channel where you basically get drink, you drink and knit stuff with friends. And it could be like knitting with friends or whatever. But then like what Gary V ended up doing, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, he ended up having a wine show years ago before his whole big push into the world that he is in now. And he would have like his mother on one episode. Then he'd have like Wayne Gretzky on the next episode. So like, who's to say your knitting show couldn't get big and you might not have celebrities on that are drinking with you, almost like the hot wings show, you know, that hot mm -hmm. ones or whatever. Same idea. Instead of eating hot wings and, and, and freaking out about how hot they are, you could have a knitting show where you're drinking together and hanging out. What I'm saying is anything really now in the world we're in, it is possible to make a living at it. But I think it's more important to find something you truly love, figure out it's a passion and then worry about the money later. I will say, I want to comment on something you said to Scott. Also, uh, don't discount... The idea that just because you're not, quote unquote, good enough now to make a living at something, because you mentioned about the stand up comedy, don't sure. discount what's possible. Because I uh, did stand up for seven, uh, sorry, nine years, 700 shows. And my first show, I didn't get a laugh and I forgot to turn the mic on. My last show, well, <laughs> I guess it's my fourth last show now because I came out of retirement last summer because I was trying to get some video for, um, I was doing an audition. I want to audition for the Apollo in New York. Um, okay. And so I had to record stuff without hair because all my other stuff was with hair because I had been retired so long. But my last show uh, before uh, that, those three shows was at uh, Second City. So for those who follow comedy, that's like an epicenter of comedy. Like this is where like uh, Dan Aykroyd, Chevy Chase, all the greats, uh, Mike Myers, Jim Carrey, they all studied at Second City. I get to perform on that stage as somebody who couldn't even get a laugh and couldn't turn the mic on. And then the, right. and I was, I performed in the great Canadian laugh off in Canada. Um, 
So you think you're funny on CBC radio? Like this is a person that, you know, couldn't get a laugh, couldn't buy a laugh for a year. And then the other side is um, on the music side, I was tone deaf still to this day. Can't tune a guitar by ear. Had a girlfriend tell me I was terrible the first time she heard me sing. And my last I, I CD was nominated for rock recording of the year. And the reason I bring this up is because I went on a tour that summer where I was charging about $400 the show solo show. Uh, and I played 30 shows. So what's that? I don't know. It's 1200 or $12,000. Is that, um, that, you know, in a summer. So never even think that like I was tone deaf, terrible. And I put in 10,000 hours and got better. You know, that's what happened. And I remember reading an interview with Jerry Seinfeld one time, a book interview where he said that it took him two years to get his first laugh. Mm -hmm. And look at the money he's made from comedy. So my point is, sure. even in a sub thing where you're not that good to start, if you put in the 10,000 hours, in my experience, almost any field, you truly can eventually, I'm not going to say master it, but become a lot better at it. Yeah, and that 10,000 hours that you're referencing for the listeners who might not be familiar with that, that's that, that was the uh, kind of mindset, like if you put in 10,000 hours in any particular area, that will get you to that like expert level. Um, and I forget exactly what the terminology is, but it, you'll get to that level where you're, you're in the elite class where, where people the, like most people are not going to hit that level in whatever uh, that category is. And, and if you do the math out, uh, that 10,000 hours, um, if you're, if you're doing it eight hours a week or, or so, like, or, or no, not eight hours, like an eight hour a day, uh, you know, 40 hour a week type job. If, if you make that your job, um, that's like three and a half years, give or take, I think, if, I, if my math is correct on that. But it, just so people know, this is not something that you can expect to happen overnight, right? This is a process like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld said two years before he got a, his first laugh, um, like, yeah, that's that's probably right. And he probably put in more hours than an eight hour day at a uh, comedy trying to refine it and writing new jokes and trying new uh, approaches at delivering the jokes and uh, trying all these different things. And and like anything, if if you try something and it doesn't work, well, OK, great. Don't do that again and try something else and, and figure out what does work. And so um I would imagine the process of figuring out what your passion and, and your purpose is um, trying to figure that out involves a little bit of trial and error, I would imagine. Right. Yeah, it definitely does. And I mean, I'm not going to say it takes the 10,000 hours. It's going to be, and it's going to be different for different people. But mm -hmm. I always say, if you can make that list I mentioned earlier, but then also get really adventurous with your life, you're going to find probably the passion in the adventure area when you're willing to do things that, you may not have done before. Um, you might already know I love doing this. So it might be just a matter of doing, spending more time doing it. You might love taking pictures and you mm -hmm. might think that's something I would, I could do even because the other thing is sometimes you don't even want to get paid to do a passion because then it ruins it for you. So I know, for yeah. example, people in my life that are really good photographers, but they will not charge a soul because they feel that dilutes the, the passion for it. So there's a, there's, like you said, there's a lot of layers to this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it does take some trial and error. And as I said, when I said, make that list, you could have 10 things on the list. It doesn't mean all 10 of those things are going to be a passion for you. That's the whole point about you take action, but at least if you put it on a list, cause you like it, at least you're doing something you like. So if you have to put a few hours into something you like, to me, that's not that big a deal. I will say right. to your point about the 10,000 hours to tell you what can transform. I uh, went to um, Liverpool last year. I actually, I don't probably can't show it. I'm a pretty big uh, John Lennon fan. I don't know if you can see okay. it's upside down, but I got a John Lennon tattoo in Liverpool in the same building they played in, which I thought was pretty epic. Um, and, and I'm a Beatles fan, but I'm more of a John Lennon fan. So uh, anyway, I went to Liverpool and I was on the tour and I got to talk to um, Pete Best, the original drummer, his nephew. And he got regaled with all this. Pete Best is still alive. So he got regaled with all the stories. In fact, uh, Pete Best's mother had their first venue that they played at for a year. And she was her, I think his father was their manager. Like, so they, the family knew what the Beatles put in for time. The Beatles put in. And they said when they went to Hamburg, they were an okay band, like decent, not that great, but decent. They put in so many hours in two and a half years in Hamburg. When they came back, they were the best band anybody knew in the area anywhere. And what I bring this up because you said about three and a half years. Well, they would say that that's where they wrote the song eight days a week. 
because they were literally playing like I, it was like something like six shows a day or something insane like that. So to your point, they weren't just putting in 40 hours. They right. were putting in now they might not have put in a, like exactly 10,000 hours, but I think even if they put in 8,000 hours, but they put it into two years, you're like, you're, you're cramming the greatness into such a short period of time. You probably don't need the 10,000 hours, but either way they in two years went from being a, like, again, a lot of people said, ah, they may make it an okay band to coming back to like, everybody's like, have you heard of the band, the Beatles? And, and again, all, and what was great about for them is they disappeared for two years. So like, it was like, people don't even, what, was there a band called the Beatles? My friend was in. And then like two years later, they come back and you're like, they're what? Oh my God, is that, that can't be the same band. Like right. they disappeared. So it wasn't like, if you watch them in real time, you'd be like, I saw them get better. But you imagine like watching them, the same four members. I think it was, I don't, I don't, Ringo wasn't in it at the time, but the same, you know, same three of the same four members, you see them one day at a show, they disappear for two years. You don't know where they're at. They come back, you see them again. And they're like next level. Great. Like it's, it's insane, but that's, what's possible from okay to this is the best band anybody's ever seen. Right. And a lot of times people will see folks who uh, just sort of appear like that. Maybe you never heard of the Beatles before they, they disappeared or whatever. And, and the first time that you heard of them was when they reappeared, but you had never heard of them before. So they're brand new to you and you go and check them out and like, Oh my gosh, these, these guys are like a overnight success. Right? How do I get that? Well, nobody is an overnight success where it's just like snap your fingers and, and, you know, all of a sudden you can sing great. You can play guitar perfectly, the drums or, you know, whatever the instruments, you, you could do all of that just, you know, in your sleep. Um, that doesn't happen. Or if it does, it's an extremely rare uh, occasion that something like that happens. But those people are off putting in the, the work before you heard them. And now what you're hearing is the benefit of all those hours of work going into it. And in tying this back to the purpose and passion, I don't think any of those guys who were in the Beatles, just using that as an example, because, because you brought it up, but um, you know, you could pick any other great musician or band or athlete. I don't think any of those people would put 10,000 hours into doing whatever their craft was if they didn't have some sort of passion about it you know if they were if that wasn't driving them and that brought them joy and they they were happy when they were doing it i don't think they would put that much time in it if it was just like a yeah you know it's it's another job you know so i i mean maybe they would do it if if it was putting food on the table and it was paying the bills but it you know th that's not going to be something that they're just going to yeah let me grind it out and i'll i'll do this but eh, it's not that interesting I, to me i don't care you know i would say i think honestly scott if that was the case it was probably the lowest paying minimum wage job they've ever had in their life because sure. when you factor how much they were working like to your point there's other ways you could make a better living that when they were starting than being there doing that um I, it compared to wrestlers i asked one time this wrestler named female wrestler named trish stratus and she's one of the most successful uh, female uh wwe you know the big business wrestler mm -hmm. uh, and she spent time with Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and I was like it fascinates me those guys together those three guys combined are bigger than the whole industry in a lot of ways they're not bigger sure. than the industry like th if they disappeared the industry wouldn't exist but I just mean they were as big as the three combined were bigger than any other unit or anything that was in that business so I said to her what do you think is the reason and she said well we all have to have passion to be in this business but she said it's the level of passion that they have that she said, I've never seen it. They're vibrating their passion. She said, you can almost see it around them. And she said, that's what she felt was the difference maker. But the reason I bring that up when you said they wouldn't do this, well, there's this wrestler. I read his um, uh, biography, I guess you'd call it. Um, his name is Mick Foley. And he wrote four books on his life and three of them were New York Times bestsellers. And he talked about in the first book, driving two hours uh, in freezing snow, winter, what have you, sleeping in his car overnight because he wanted to make sure he was there early in a parking lot where a gym was at to go and wrestle for 25 bucks. And he said, when it would snow while I was sleeping, I would open up the back trunk and come out like a bear out of hibernation. 
<laughs> and he would go in and wrestle for 25 bucks and then get back in the car and drive two hours to go home. And he said, and then once I finally got in the big times, you know, he said I, I was wrestling uh, regularly. He said we'd travel like four guys to a car and he said we'd sleep four guys to a hotel room, meaning like you'd flip a coin and one got a bed and the other three were on the floor. Right. And, at that, and, and at that point, he was making like $100 a week. You know, my point, and, and also your point, is who would go through that unless they loved it? So go back to the purpose, tying it back in. You only do that kind of stuff, in my opinion, if you have a calling for it and or it's a why and or it's a passion. Now, is it, in your experience, um, you know, with the folks that you've worked with, is it possible that people just aren't very passionate about things in general? Is it is it hard to figure that out for someone like that or or in your experience is there something out there for everybody or or, or are they or are there some people who who maybe just aren't passionate people uh what, what is your experience with that i would go so far as to say not only do i think there's something for everybody but i also think that um it's already there I, I don't say we find it. I, I mean, I, I maybe even said it in this interview, I sometimes fall back and say find it, but I really feel we uncover it. So it feels like an onion layer and we just got to keep peeling the layers. But I do believe it's there for everyone. But you make a great point because there's some other variables involved. It's not as simple as, yeah, yeah here's how you find a passion, like make a list, whatever. The, the other variable that's involved in that is the want to do it. So for example, mm -hmm. whenever I was battling hypochondria and anxiety and all that, I didn't know this at the time, Scott, and you don't know usually when you're in it, but I was a pessimist. I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, tomorrow it's going to snow probably. Like everything was always like, oh, it's probably going to do this. Oh, life keeps happening to me, not for me. And But it was sure. always like, poor me, basically. And so if you are in that mindset, it's and it was hard for me, because I, I, it was a happy accident that I got I got tricked into performing stand-up that night. If that wouldn't happen, I can't tell you I'd be, I wouldn't be on this interview probably. And I don't know if I would have found my passion. What I'm mm -hmm. getting at is it had to be, because I wasn't ready yet, it had to be tricked into me in the sense that as pessimistic as I was, if somebody said, hey, make a list of things you love doing, blah, I would have been like, yeah. So I, to your point, it's not, I don't think there's anybody who doesn't have a purpose built inside. I believe we were all born with a purpose. I also believe there's at least one thing everybody's passionate about. I believe there's more than one, but there's at least one. Having said that, the third part to this, which is drives deeper to your question, is I don't, and this is very blunt, but I don't think everybody will find their purpose in life ever. I don't think we'll ever get to a point where everybody's figured out their purpose uh, or a passion because of the fact that you're always going to have somebody that really is just can't break free of the chains of let's just call it negativity and so so and, and then when i say that when we're when if i'm working with somebody on this i would start at a different place if that's where they're at i would start at the point of i'm not a big fan of the term fake it till you make it but for some people it's necessary meaning for some people you have to say hey just stick with me for this for one month i want you to uh go to this website and read a positive quote every day for one month i want you to take out a positive person you know for lunch like you have to get them in that side of going to the point where <clears throat> so much of their life is positive that all of a sudden it's less attractive to be negative. So I think you have to get them in a positive mind frame if you want to also then next help them find a passion, which then helps them find the purpose. The other option is they reach a dark night of the soul, like I did with stand up. Like I was sinking, right? Like I hy hypochondria, thinking I was going to die every day, anxiety. And then uh, I wrote a stage play in a fringe fest, which was the only little bright in my tunnel. Uh, I had to write myself a part and I didn't want to be at, like, I didn't want to be on the stage. I was terrified of that. I wrote myself a part and then I, I had to, because one of the actors injured his ankle. And so I asked one of the other actors, how can I get comfortable with the stage thing? And he said, I don't know if this is the answer, but I'm going to a stand-up comedy workshop at the university. You want to join me? And I said, that sounds horrifying. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. And my thinking, Scott, was I'll never get on a stage. I'm just going to go learn how to write and stuff and, and maybe just get the idea of how people get on stage in case I ever have to. But how we got tricked is the person that got us to promote the show didn't tell us that we were the entertainers. And we found out with five minutes notice. Well, what I'm getting at is all of that stuff had to happen. And I also had to, I was sitting at the stage. People asked me, why did I eventually perform that night? I was sitting at the stage and I had this visual, which I never have, of me and an old guy, me as an old guy sitting next to another old guy, looking at the stage as somebody else performing stand-up and say, you know, I was going to do that 
30 years ago. Wish I would have. And the regret of that was worse than the fear of doing it. So I bring all this up to say, for me, it was like, even though it didn't seem like a dark night, it was really my dark night of the soul because I was at the end of like, how much longer can I live like this? And then this happened stanced upon me. So what I'm saying is it won't always just happen for people. And if you're going to work with somebody, chances are they probably have some deep rooted negativity there that you have to work on before they can get to the point where they find a passion, which is before they get to a point usually where they'll discover what their purpose is. So I hope that answers the question, but I don't think it's as easy for everybody to just kind of go, you know what? I want a passion in my life. And you know what? I want to know what my purpose is. No, I agree. And I'm glad that you put it the way that you did, because in in my mind, uh, there's going to be a lot of people out there who, and I've met a lot of people who just, kind of have that negative energy, I guess, for a lack of better words, where they just, I don't know, nothing is interesting. They're just kind of blah, plain, no, nothing, nothing's really exciting. It's, it's, everything's just, I don't know, vanilla for a lack of better words. It's not, not super exciting. I mean, it, it's there, it gets the job done, but it, not, not really exciting, but uh, you know, even if you are that pessimist or negative thinking where nothing's interesting and nothing is exciting to me and nothing fills me with joy and and you have that negativity going on inside of you. um, First off, that's an issue that you got to work on, I'm, I'm sure as well, but be open to trying new things. Like in your case, you, you said you were tricked to doing stand up comedy, but imagine you were, you were there and they're like, okay, your time, get, get up on the stage. You're, you're going up there and you're like, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, your passion was sitting right there in front of you, staring you in the face and you didn't know it at the time, but doing that thing enabled you to figure it out. And had you just not gotten on the stage, you, may never have figured it out and we may not be sitting here having this conversation right now, you know? So I think for the listeners, you know, be open to trying new things, um, actively seek them out yourself or, if, you know, a friend or a family member invites you to go do this thing that you never otherwise would have done. Go do it. You know, even if it's not something that you're super passionate about, maybe you will be, um, you know, these, these types of things, you're not going to figure it out until you try it. And, um, you know, once when you try it, then, then you might have, a, a little, uh, glimpse into what it could be like. And then, then maybe you start going down that rabbit hole a little more. And that's the way I see it anyway. Yeah. You know, I will say one last thing in that area is that, um, it is fascinating to me and it's not, and I'll say, this is not for me to judge, but it's fascinating to me people that I know, even in my life who say, Oh, I always have a dark cloud over me. Don't I? And, and like, and I say like, we, we know a couple of people, like if they go on a vacation, like you shouldn't, you know, jokingly, but say you shouldn't be with me. Cause I always have a dark cloud. But what I find fascinating, Scott, is that if you think whenever I was battling hypochondria and anxiety that I didn't have a dark cloud over me, I don't know how much darker a cloud could be. Like I was literally thinking every day, like, this is it. I'm going to live yep. till I'm 20. This is it. And every day, I mean, so I had a dark cloud over me. My point of that is, is I think they view it as like almost like a badge of honor that I just have bad luck. But what I'm getting at is if that's the case, then I shouldn't have been able to get rid of that dark cloud Mm because I had a dark cloud that was perpetual and every day. And all of a sudden now I don't have a dark cloud ever. Like I jokingly say, I carry my own sunshine around. But I mean, like I literally got rid of that dark cloud. So what I'm saying is, I think they view it as bad luck. I think it's simply because they constantly always think crap is going to happen, that crap happens. Like, I do believe, even if you don't get into the, um, you know, the, like into the very spiritual side of like what we think about we create, I think it's at least, at the very least, safe to say what you spend your time around is what you get more of. Meaning like if you hang around with people that are breaking into places and you join them, <laughs> then you're going to have similar results to what they had. And I think that we can all agree on, meaning like uh, 
you know, and I think if you ride around on a motorbike, then you are probably going to hang around with people that ride around on motorbikes and, you know, and that's going to be your environment. And that's, Hey, if that's, that's awesome. Like I have friends that that's their life. Like their, their passion and purpose is riding the motorbike on the weekend. But what I'm saying mm -hmm. is, is that you don't even have to think about it. Like the idea of I'm creating nothing into something. Just think about it from the perspective of if I'm if I if I smile at everybody that walks down the street, chances are I'm going to have a better day than if I frown and growl at people. I think that's I think we could all maybe deep down know that's true. So what I'm getting at is that dark cloud. I believe for most people is simply a representation of the fact that you think bad things are going to happen today, and so you're you're experiencing those bad things because of the fact that that's what you expect to happen, and the universe is delivering. So anyway, I say that because I think the dark cloud thing, we have, like I say, three people that specifically say that terminology. And I think I had a dark cloud and I got rid of the dark cloud. So I think it's possible for them too. Yeah. And th there's a saying, if the only tool that you have is a hammer, all your problems are going to start to look like nails. And, you know, it, it goes to that mindset. If you, if you are always having that negativity, that negative thinking, um, that's the tool that you're carrying around th with you to navigate through life you're carrying around the pessimism the negativity the woe is me victim mentality and you're carrying that around and all the problems that you now see are now okay well yep it, naturally that's going to happen because i'm the victim and naturally that's going to happen because well everything bad happens to me and that's that's just the the mindset that you're going to have but if you can t twist that around and um you know figure out a more healthy way to to think about these things that might that might help you out in the long run you know and if you're hanging out with people who are pessimistic all the time well you're probably going to end up being more pessimistic than you would had you not hung out with those people if you hang out with people who are more on the happy side you're probably going to be happier you know it's just a matter of uh, you know what your your uh, mindset is and uh, enabling you to uh, have that kind of growth and that, that happiness. So, um, so I, I like, I like how you, you phrased all that. And, and I think this hopefully gives the listeners, um, no matter where they're at in, in their journey of finding their, their purpose or their passion, um, wherever they are in that journey, hopefully this gives them some, some steps to start taking, you know, if you're that type of person where nothing is interesting to you, you, you got all these, this negativity going on. Well, okay. Step one, you got to figure that out and, and work on that. And if you somehow somewhere along the way, sort of like you did stumble across your passion, um, well, great. Now you have that and you can work with that. Um, but at least if you can break through that, it, just a little bit, you, you at least open the door to the possibility that you can find something that brings you some joy and happiness and um, sense of purpose and, and uh, figure out what that passion is in your life to kind of get that, that spark in your life. Um, you know, I, I know, again, going back to the military veterans, a lot of times um, they're the type of people who want to serve other people you know, that the service of, you know, military service is that thing where you're now serving something bigger than yourself. Um, if you're looking for something and you can't figure out what it is, I don't know, maybe, maybe do some volunteer work, um, you know, in something in your community. It doesn't have to be, be anything huge. It could be volunteering at a soup kitchen or at a veterans uh, hospital or something along those lines to, help other folks. And, and that's that you might figure out that's your passion. And maybe there's something that you can do that kind of branches off of that and make it something bigger, or maybe it's something you do on the weekends or, or something in your, in your spare time. But, you know, at least that, that points you in the right direction. And, um, you may, may start doing those types of things and you may hate it and you may think this is stupid. I don't want to do this anymore. So, Okay, good. Check the box. You tried it. Move on to the next thing. You don't have to keep doing it and, you know, uh, figuring out that it's just not working for you. Go on to the next thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, 
Corey, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you today. Uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to uh, tell people where they can go to get in touch with you, find out more about the types of work that you do, and um, you know maybe if they are struggling and they need some guidance and a uh, little bit of direction in finding their own passion and purpose in life, um, maybe they can reach out to you and and get some advice. But uh, where people, where can people go to find you? And you mentioned your book earlier. Um, tell us about the books and where people can go to find uh, those as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much uh, for that opportunity. And so there's two books I would probably share that we have. And the new one, I mean, it's literally, um, I have a copy in my hand. We have author copies. It's literally launching June 25th. And so, you know, in real time, when people are hearing this, because it's evergreen, it'll be available. But I just say that's how new this is. It's uh, 2024, the timestamp it. Uh, we are releasing it in June. And uh, so this book is a fictional parable. So it's similar to The Alchemist or Celestine Prophecy or The Greatest Salesman in the World or The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. But basically, it's 10 life lessons that are delivered through a fictional narrative or story. Two passengers on a plane basically old guy young guy strangers uh it's called the flight that changes everything because essentially the old guy uh becomes the enlightened passenger to the young guy and teaches them 10 life lessons so that book um has been in the works for three years i'm really really proud of it uh it's been endorsed by a lot of really um people that i've been you know fans of their work for years which is really humbling and so that's one option is to grab that book and i know kind of say in a second, um, you know, how to grab the stuff, but that's one option. The second option is a book I wrote, which is more directly related to our conversation today, uh, a few years back called The Book of Why and How. And that book, almost the opposite of this book, that book is nonfiction and it's uh, broken down in three sections. And one of them is finding your why. So exactly what we've talk, been talking about today. And I go into depth or detail there around how to do it. So, you know, I always say for the price of the book, you can learn what it took me thousands of hours and thousands of dollars to learn. But basically, we teach you how to find your why. And then the second section is on how to thrive once you have found your why. And the third section on is how to become more enlightened. So how to be able to sleep at night when you're serving people, essentially. And so and then it has 400 quotes at the back by other thought leaders. So there's either of those two books. Both are available on all the places you would expect. So, uh, you know, all the retailers like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Target, and so on. Books a million as well. Uh, so you can get the, either of those books. Uh, and then if you want to reach out to me directly, like just to reach out and say, hey, I heard you on the show. Uh, hey, I have a quick question. Uh, can you send me this around finding my purpose? Whatever that looks like. Uh, the best place is probably Corey, which is C-O-R-E-Y, at Blue, which is B-L-U without the E, Talks, with an S on the end, dot com. So Corey at Blue Talks dot com. Uh, reach out there. That's the best email and easiest one to reach out to me at. And like I said, either grab one or two of the both one or both of those books. Uh, feel free to reach out via email. And I think that'll give you at least a, a big window into all the stuff that we've been doing over the last number of years. Excellent. And I will have links to the books and uh, the email address that you provided. I'll have all of those links in the show notes. So folks who are listening, you can go check it out there and grab that information uh, if, if you need it and you want to get in touch with Corey or check out the books, uh, that type of stuff. Um, now, interesting that you mentioned that you did uh, you start kind of started off finding your passion doing stand-up. Uh, I like to end each episode with a little bit of humor, um, just as a way to put a smile on folks' face. Uh, so that way, you know, the, the topics that sometimes we talk about, they might be a little heavy, a little bit, you know, a little bit much, and people might be leaving feeling a little down, maybe a little, you know, not, not so great. And so I like to put a little smile on folks' face. So, um, I, typically do this with either like a funny video or a joke that I tell and with the jokes, the, the delivery or me, I don't know, may not be all that funny and you can laugh at me and that's perfectly fine too, because I'm cool with that. So long as I get a laugh, um, I'm, I'm okay with it. So, uh, if you don't mind and indulge me, I'll, I'll have, uh, this quick joke here and hopefully it produces at least one laugh. Um, even if it's at my expense, that's fine. So 
So there's a lady, she walks into a bank in New York City and she asks for the loan officer. And she says she's going to Europe on business for two weeks and she needs to borrow $5,000. So the bank officer says that the bank will need some sort of security or collateral for the loan. And the woman hands over the keys to her brand new Rolls Royce. And the car is parked out in the street in front of the bank and she has a title and everything checks out. And the bank agrees to accept the car as collateral for the loan. And the bank's president and its officers all laugh at the lady for using a $300,000 car as collateral against a $5,000 loan. And an employee of the bank then took the keys and drove the, the car down into the bank's underground garage, parks it there. And two weeks later, the woman returns from her trip and repays the $5,000 and the interest, which came to $15. And the loan officer says, hey, miss, we, we're really happy to have had your business. This transaction worked out great, um, but we're a little confused. You, you check, we checked you out and we found out you're a millionaire, a multimillionaire. And what puzzles us is why would you bother to borrow $5,000? And she says, where else in New York City can I park my car for two weeks for only $15 and expect it to be there when I return? <laughs> so, so I, I, it's not, it's not often, but I, I saw where that was headed and I, I love it. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's like, I, without knowing, maybe unconsciously I heard it years ago or similar, but like maybe, I saw yeah. I was like waiting for that punch because I was like, I, well, and, but yeah, honestly, I wasn't think I knew it was going somewhere. But when you said the $15, then I was like, yep. okay, I see where this is going. That's awesome. I love it. I like, yeah. I actually love the ingenuity of it too. Like, I hope somebody hears this and actually takes them up on that. I know, right? Like, why not go do it? And, and, uh, you know, there's going to be banks now in New York City who are going to be like, we need more parking spaces. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. That's amazing. Great one. So that's great. Um, anyways, Corey, thank you again for taking the time to come on uh, and sharing your story, sharing you know how folks can find their purpose and their passion in life, uh, and and find some joy, create some joy in their lives, and not um, you know feel like it's a dead end or whatever it is that they're they're doing. They they can find those things, and um, you know if it's if money is an issue, money will will figure it out itself out uh, down the line. So find that that thing um, and and stick with it and and you'll you'll make it through. So again for the listeners, all the links uh, that we talked about will be in the show notes. So check it out, uh, get in touch with Corey and uh, find your your passion. Amazing. Thanks so much, Scott. Thanks for listening to the Drive On podcast. If you want to support the show, please check out Scott's book Surviving Son on Amazon. All of the sales from that book go directly back into this podcast and work to help veterans in need. You can also follow the Drive On podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. 